wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Hey, we're coming to you here with another great podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Be sure to give us a like, subscribe to us on YouTube, hit that bell notification. You can see the whole video version if you listen to the audio version of this on the iTunes and all those uh, great podcasting syndications that uh, show our show. Um, but you can see the video version, which is really cool. It's like pleasure for your eyes. Video. It's new. Check it out today at youtube.com for chess Chris Voss. Um, you can also refer the show to your friends, neighbors, relatives. Uh, grab their phones, sign them up, get them to subscribe to the cvpn.com or Chris Voss podcast network.com. Nine podcasts. What do I get the time to do what I do? I don't know. I'm still asking myself that question. But we have the greatest Chris in the whole whole wide world maybe the universe we're still working on the legal analysts of that and whether or not we can attorneys will let us say that but until then we'll just say we are uh today we have a most exceptional author on the program her name is lauren mcgoodwin lauren mcgoodwin is the ceo of career contessa She's a number one power move advocate and has a life mission to help women build successful and fulfilling careers on their terms. She's launched Career Contessa in 2013 out of her master's thesis project to close the gap in career development resources for women. Career Contessa now helps over 2 million women each year with their careers through content, online learning courses, and job listings. Formerly, Lauren was a recruiter for Hulu, focused on hiring employer branding, and talent development. She has a bachelor's in education from University of Oregon and a master's in communication management from USC, where she wrote her thesis on millennial women and career resources. She's spoken at TED Women, Watermark Conference for Women, and South by Southwest, appeared on Cheddar TV, Good Day LA, and regularly contributes on career advice to outlets like Good Morning America, Goop, and more. Lauren is also the host of Career Contestants podcast, The Females, covering all things work, women, traits of success, and her just released book, Power Moves, How Women Can Pivot, Reboot, and Build a Career Purpose from Harper Business. And she loves to stay in touch on Instagram. Lauren, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for having me. Awesome sauce. It's great to have you on, and I got a chance to listen to some of your book. It's awesome. Uh, can you give us the dot-coms and links that people can take and look you up on the interwebs? Yeah, so the Career Contessa website is just careercontessa.com. Power Moves, the book, can be found at powermovesbook.com. And then we're at Career Contessa on every single social channel you can think of. <laughs> awesome sauce. And you got this great book, Power Moves, How Women Can Pivot, Reboot, and Build a Career Purpose. And so this is pretty awesome, probably especially for times right now where a lot of people are going to be looking for a job, new career moves, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. It's very nice that the timing of the book had the word pivot in the tagline. I don't know if I would recommend launching your first book in between, you know, a crisis slash pandemic, but it is what it is. And I'm happy it's helpful right now. I think it's going to be important to take a nap because people are kind of pivoting whether they like it or not right now, unfortunately. Yeah. Everybody's career has changed, whether you work for yourself, you work for someone else. It does not matter. Even if you're still employed, your job has changed probably right now. And it may change in the future, too, the way things yes. are going. And, and uh, you know, one of the things I have talked about to people uh, during this whole crisis is not only is educating themselves to make themselves more valuable, whether they go to work for someone else or whether they maybe – uh, go up the ladder uh, as, as, as things shift around. Sometimes they're getting rid of upper management, middle management, and all this stuff. So your book's a great way that people can go get educated, get prepared. And I've been telling people, read great books, get educated, get ready, because you don't know what the future holds. But if you're smarter, you'll have a better chance in this marketplace. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think whether you are looking for a job right now or you're trying to you know, remain valuable and influential in the one you have, there's tips for all of that in my book. It was not meant for 
just the job searcher or just the person who's running their company, all the tips are really applicable. And you've got great insight being the uh, formerly the university recruiter for Hulu. So uh, you were focused on hiring, employer branding, and program manager uh, management for them. So you, you know what people are looking for. And then, of course, you've been on the other side of the table as well. Yeah, absolutely. I graduated during a recession when there were no jobs. I know what it's like to have to take a job just to be able to pay the bills. I was able to land my recruiting job at Hulu with no prior experience. So I understand how to make a career transition and a pivot. And now, of course, running Career Contessa, my job is every day, day in and day out, to talk to other people about their challenges, find the best answers for them. Um, I learned from so many of our readers, you know, just crowdsourcing for information. So I have the best job and, and it, it will never change or it will never end. I mean, because careers are deeply personal and it's humans usually working with other humans and those dynamics. So there's, there's a lot to be said, not just about uh, being on the other side of the hiring table and knowing what hiring managers are looking for, but also being in the room with managers when they make decisions about who gets promoted and things like that. That's awesome. That's definitely data you would take want to have when you're looking for a job and, and how to prepare yourself. You know, um, uh, wh what sort of background did you have in, in uh, coming up that got you motivated to get in this career, write this book and everything else? Yeah. Um, so I was mostly motivated by just sort of my own expectation hangover of like, I went to college, I got good grades, I had internships, you know, I quote unquote checked all the right boxes to have said great career, basically graduated and like fell fat on, flat on my face of like, whoa, not, none of my expectations were met in any way, shape or form. Working as an admin assistant inside of a dental school was very boring, very, just like I was just waiting for the phone to ring. And so I think I was mostly motivated to figure out how do people not hate going to work every day. <laughs> uh, Cause it was like day one, I was like, there's no way I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. Um, so I think that was motivation. I certainly, when I got my job at Hulu, which I loved, I loved the people I worked with. I loved, I, I think that was my uh, first like aha moment of like, if you can find the career and the company that are a good fit, actually things do click into place. Um, and then as far as Career Contessa, I was actually, when I, when I transitioned over to Hulu, I was maybe like one or two classes shy of graduating uh, with my master's degree, so, which I was doing part-time. And so I was getting ready to write my thesis. I wrote it on millennial women and career resources and Career Contessa was actually the prototype of that thesis. So I didn't launch Career Contessa to be a business. I launched it actually to be a, a school project, but um, it's obviously very serendipitous that it turned into that. And, and a lot of that was just as many entrepreneurs would probably say, like, I needed this tool and it didn't exist. And so I created it. Um, and it's just kind of snowballed <laughs> into really this very, very comprehensive resource versus, you know, just a blog from the beginning. And so many women, so many people looking for jobs need these tools, right? Yeah. And uh, so you find people that are in the same place. I love the uh, experience of an entrepreneur where you basically go, hey, I have a pain or a problem and I'm going to fix it for me. And then you're like, wow, everyone else is the same sort of pain. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, let's make everybody uh, make the world a better place. I, I think this is great what you've taken and done. Uh, I was reading through some of the different reviews in your books and some of the, some of the different audience people that you had in our research. And uh, a lot of people just love following your emails. They follow your email. I guess you have an email list that goes out and stuff to help support people. And they've just, they just love it. They talk really highly about it. So um, you're motivating a lot of people. I can tell from what I'm seeing out in our research. Um, and then you have your own podcast. So you're doing that as well. So people can tune in. Yep. It's called The Females. It has sort of a funky spelling. It's F-E-M-A-I-L-S. So it's supposed to be like female and emails mixed together. Ah, yes. The fe fe emails? <laughs> There yeah, you go. yeah, I know. Uh, sometimes I'm like, maybe I shouldn't have gotten that clever with the name, but it's it's a great podcast. And every episode, we teach somebody or we teach people something new that they can you know implement into work that day. So that's kind of cool. There you go. If you're looking for a job, you may want to tune into that. Definitely. Um, so uh, give us some more rundown, some experience, uh, information more on the book, some of the details that are in it. Yeah. So the book is called Power Moves. And what a power move is, is an intentional 
proactive move in your career. So the opposite of a power move would be uh, being reactive, like whatever is going to happen, you're going to just let it happen. Um, the opposite of a power move is doing things because you think you're supposed to be doing them or taking shortcuts to get to the necessary uh, places in life. So power moves and what I found over, you know, seven plus years of running Career Contessa is that the women who had successful and fulfilling careers, they were making intentional proactive moves or power moves as I call them in their career. It might be in power moves. So just so everyone knows they can be daily, like your daily morning routine. They can be more in the medium. Um, so medium might be like pitching a project or they can be big, like starting your own company. There, there's not just one type of power move and everybody's able to make power moves. They're, they're habits, behaviors that lead you to building a successful career on your terms. So what I wanted to do with the book is obviously give examples of power moves, but also lay this out in a framework that people could use as an approach to their career. So the book is actually laid out in um, a framework that's broken into four pieces. So we start with self-care, then we talk about relationships, career, and then money. And that order is actually really intentional because if you're not taking care of yourself, you're not going to be able to build good relationships, have a great career, manage your money, right? And so each of those items builds on themselves. And I, in the book, I give people foundational power moves that they should be making. And then the idea is that once you have this really nice foundational toolkit, um, you know, in, in practice, then you'll start recognizing power moves and being able to make them in your day-to-day -day life and career, especially. I like how you laid that out where you, where you took care of the self care first and then move through the progression of, of career or, you know, taking care of everything. Cause that does make sense. Um, with self care, let's get into that a little bit. What is, what are some of the aspects of that that are stand out in some of the things and how people should uh, care better for themselves so they can have a good career? Yeah. I mean, I know people are probably like, Oh, self care. What a buzzword. I, I know that we've branded it all cool, but at the end of the day, self-care is extremely important. It's the reason why they say put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you help others because you can't bring your best self to work or to life, to your family, to anything if you're not taking care of yourself. So some of them are related to just good sleep. Are you creating like a nighttime routine or ritual to help you sleep well? Are you um, eating healthy vegetables, right? Are you managing your emotional, physical, mental, maybe even spiritual health for yourself? Mm -hmm. um, those are all things that people, especially when they get busy, um, just... Oh, I thought I was going to sneeze. Uh, they just ignore. And the problem is, is that it basically catches up to you. There's no similar to sleep. You can't sleep for 10 hours to make up on the fact that you've slept for one hour, five nights in a row or something like that. So those are some of the self-care items you can do. Another one that I really love is managing your inner critic. So the narratives that you tell yourself, uh, your brain starts to believe those things. And so what, what you actually say to yourself is incredibly important. They can be negative or they can be really positive. Um, one of the tips I give to people in the book is to actually change it from being an inner critic to an inner coach. You know, inner critics might be the thing that motivate a lot of people. I know a lot of high achievers, they, they kind of actually love their inner critic, but I would challenge people to say, all right, I get why it's there and it maybe does motivate you, but can you change the role of your inner critic from an inner critic to an inner coach? Coaches are there to support you. Critics are there to take you down. Um, so when I talk about self-care, I don't just mean the physical, I mean the emotional as well as the spiritual, uh, mental and all that good stuff. That's really awesome. I, wow, I, I need to write that on a shirt or put that on a, <laughs> on a computer. Be an inner coach, especially to, you know, that self ego that people have that can be really critical. Yes. That's one of my things. I got that dude in the head who goes, you're, you know, imposter syndrome, you're stupid, you're, you know, and I, I imagine yeah. a lot of people have that same sort of thing. Um, and uh, in fact, my my inner critic is actually the uh, sergeant guy from Full Metal Jacket, you know, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and uh, that's mine. So yeah, don't have that. Um, do you find that a lot of women have issues with that? Cause I know one thing about women is they're multitaskers and especially they're like a family. They have a lot going on. There's a lot going on in their head. Like men are really multitaskers, but women are. And, and I imagine it's probably easier to get lost with all that, with all the noise and stimuli and, you know, the agendas and everything that they're working uh, for what they want to take and do and juggling, you know, motherhood, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do you find that a lot of women have trouble with that, with the, uh, the inner criticism and, and, uh, and uh, you know, self-care? 
Yeah. I mean, self-care in general, I think is very challenging for women because for a few reasons, you're right. We are multitaskers. So we have a hard time decompartmentalizing, but also, um, society and the way we were raised was very much t giving us messages of girls are supposed to be nice. Girls are supposed to be uh, people pleasers, you know, putting other people before us. We're very empathetic. So we feel the emotions of people around us uh, more often than men do. And so for women, it's incredibly important that you recognize these patterns for yourself because it, it, it snowballs out of control very quickly where doing, you know, putting the task that you need to do for yourself uh, to the side one night turns into now it's now you never have gone back to it, you know? Um, and I think that for women, it seems like the more we put on our plate, the actually the more we're able to handle. So we actually need to start recognizing like, just because you can put it on your plate and add it to your plate and probably manage it doesn't mean that you should. Um, and I think for that, it's, it's about prioritization and, and being really clear about your boundaries and what to say no to. And, and um, that is just always incredibly hard, not just because it's hard for women, but also society expects women to be more willing to go with the flow and to help them and, and things like that. So it's about, it's a relearning, uh, I think, for everybody too, with the expectations of that. I know, you know, mothers will, will do that thing where they'll take care of the cooks, the kids, they'll cook the food, they'll do everything. They won't eat all day long, but, you know, they make sure everyone else eats first. And, and uh, that's why mothers are such great people. But I, I, I can imagine that's a thing. But laying that foundation is really smart in my mind because you're, you're, you're making sure that, you, like you say, you can't take care of anybody else if you don't take care of yourself first. Otherwise, you just wear yourself down and then you're at the end of your rope and you can't perform well and you can't think well. And, yeah. You know. Uh, so what's the next step after self-care? So the next step is relationships. So they actually found, the researchers uh, found that the next thing that makes people actually the most fulfilled in their life outside of, you know, obviously just being healthy and, and, and whatnot um, is their relationships to other people. So I always encourage people to think about that when you think about how can I find my quote unquote dream job, which I don't believe in, but let's just use that because it's a common phrase that we see everywhere. It's like, Dream jobs maybe don't necessarily exist, but dream coworkers, dream teams, uh, and what makes those Pe where you have respect, you have trust, um, you have good communication. So relationships and, and who you have in your life, and, and I, I'm talking about relationships at work, but also your relationships outside of work. Those are something that you really have to prioritize because they're actually the thing that when people are always like, well, what will make me happy? It's like, good relationships will make you happy. And, and, and that's not about having the most amount of friends. It's about having good friends. It's about cultivating um, those relationships and not just having a bunch of people in your network or followers on you know, your Instagram or LinkedIn or anything like that. Um, and I think right now, especially during the pandemic, everyone is hearing this advice of like network, network, network. Well, <laughs> that's great but i think we you know there's a lot of tips in the book that talk about how to network correctly how to be a respectful networker how to prepare to have a successful informational interview or first phone call so i'm all about people building connections but you need to think of it almost like an atm if you're just withdrawing all the time from your network there's going to be nothing left so you need to be making more deposits than you do withdrawals when it comes to building those relationships and it will actually make you happier in the end too that's what my band keeps telling me. <laughs> no, but you are correct. Uh, it, it, you know, I recently I've been doing a uh, audit of my Twitter and my uh, LinkedIn account. And on LinkedIn, I was like an open networker. So I, you know, it's accepted everybody. Yeah. And I maxed out to 30,000 and same thing with Twitter. And now I'm going back through it going, who the heck are these people? And, yeah. you know, and turns out like half of them are in India and people in India are really nice people, but they really can't do that much for what I want to do for business for me. And it's really hard to get the money out of them too. <laughs> you know, Cause they're like, well, we don't know who you are on the other side of the world. And you know, someone from Texas can come collect from me if I don't pay him. Um, but uh, so, you know, like you say, there needs to be value in those sort of stuff. So you recommend people use their social aspects and uh, LinkedIn, different things to try and uh, make sure that they network and, and uh, it's easier to find jobs for them. Yeah. I mean, networking is a great way to find jobs when you do it correctly. There is a correct way of doing it. Um, one of my favorite tips in the book is called respect the double opt-in, which is 
You know, if I want to make an intro, if someone asked me to make an introduction to you, Chris, instead of just making the introduction first, you ask Chris, Hey, are you okay with me making an introduction to this person? Once he opts in, then I say, okay, great. Now I'm going to make an introduction for you. So both people need to be opting into the connection before we just start constantly introing people on email. Um, not only is it going to make a more successful introduction, but also we need to be very respectful of people's time. Not everybody can or wants to network all the time. Um, and, and so that's something I see like one of the networking rules that I, I think definitely needs to be spread more often. Um, the other thing about networking is being res really respectful of people's time. The other tip I would say for networking is be prepared. So for example, if I was going to have an informational interview with someone, let's say I had been an entrepreneur, but now because of COVID, I was going to go back to looking for a full-time job and I was having an informational interview with someone that works at a company, do as much research about that person and that company as you can so that when you take the 20 minutes, max 30 minutes to have a conversation with them, not only are you guiding the conversation, but you're you're asking the questions that you can't already find online or, you know, that are easy to find. So you're making the most of that time that you do spend with somebody. And if you are really impressive in these networking conversations, guess what? People are going to want to help you. People are going to want to connect you for jobs and things like that. But especially right now where everybody is kind of, you know, hammering down on, you know, networking and where, who can help them do this or that. You have to be really, really thoughtful and provide value, even if the value is just being really respectful of their time and, and asking good questions. You know, some of the, some of the really coolest people I've ever known have been like monster networkers. Like they know everybody, they've taken the time to know everybody, they take the time to know you. And, and, and not only are they, they usually give more than they take. Um, like well, Adam they're... Grant talks about givers, you know, mm -hmm. and, and givers are the most successful. So that's exact, exactly what you're saying. There's science behind to prove why they're successful. There, there definitely is. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. I mean, I have people call, they'll call me up and be like, hey, do you need anything, Chris? I'm like, no, I'm really good, but I know who to call if I, <laughs> if, I, if I need to. But, you know, you always want to help those people. They always want to help you because they're givers. Um, and, it, you know, it, you bring up some really good points. I love the points that you, and the analogies and that you brought to stuff that's kind of thinking out of the box. People do need to do these things. What's the third step in the four-step process? <laughs> so the next step the is... <laughs> uh, the next step is career. So career is probably self-explanatory. And to be very honest, it could be its own entire book. But what I started with career is first um, helping people identify what it is. Like the first question we get all the time at Career Contest is how do I figure out what I want to do? And what I encourage people to do is start by understanding your career, what I call your career ideals. So what are your must haves in a job? What are your deal breakers in a have? What are your nice to haves? And most people don't ever start their job search thinking about what am I good at? What do I want to have in my next role? What they do is they go on LinkedIn or indeed.com and they just hit apply, 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 apply. Um, we have this term in recruiting called spray and pray where you spray your resume everywhere and you pray that someone will pick it up. They're not going to pick it up. And it's because you haven't actually done anything that's going to make your application intentional, right? You probably have one resume and you're sending it out everywhere. So in the book, I take you through how to figure out your career ideals. And then the next step is to, instead of focusing on the job title, focus on the companies. I find that mm. that really helps people get unstuck in the whole job search thing. If instead of focusing on the job title that you want to pinpoint, think about where do you want to work? Industries, companies, um, your career ideals will obviously help uh, support that. And then you basically match the two lists together. And then you, hopefully you've narrowed it down to maybe five amazing companies that you know are a good fit for you. You guys align on values, you align on all the other good stuff that you are your have to haves. Um, and then what you can do is you can kind of work your way backwards into a job there, start networking with people that work there, um, start thinking about what skills gaps you need to fill. And that makes it much less overwhelming than just being a sea of applications in front of you and applying and hoping that somebody calls you back. So those are kind of the important parts when it comes to the job search. And then of course, in the book, the other part is all about how to be successful within the role that you have and, and, and really focusing on your ongoing career development and advancement in your career. Because, you know, everyone focuses so much on getting a job, but it's like, that's just kind of one step in the career process. You get the job, but then what? You have to be successful. You want to build your way. You want to develop your career. You want to create value and influence at work. How do you do all those things? So let me ask you this. Um, 
to, to your prior note, the, the, if I was a woman, one of the things I want to be doing is looking for companies that are really big on equality and making sure that women have that equal opportunity to raise the ranks, uh, companies that really, you know, kind of they signal that in their communications and their values and stuff. Um, I would imagine that's a smart thing to take and do, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you are a working parent finding a company whose culture um, has paid uh, paternity leave, maybe it's a company where the CEO is a parent, like what, what's important to you, you know, and, and you can learn so much more about a company than you can about a job title. And that will also tell you, because um, at the end of the day, a lot of people can do a lot of different skills. You can learn on the job, but when you're part of a company and the culture of that company and the values of those companies those you don't change very often. So, you know, for me, yeah, certainly a place that, you know, has been vocal about equality, um, has been vocal about, you know, supporting uh, not just women in the workplace, but working families. Um, it would be great to see female leaders. You know, I think it's becoming even more important to like, hey, what, what is the diversity um, mixer of your demographic of your uh team is everybody who works here white from an ivy league school because that's not a lot of diversity um do people actually feel like there's solid inclusion at this company there's a lot of things that are more important to people than i think when people think oh it must be salary that's the most important most people don't rate salary as the most important thing for them at a job it's who their boss is, the people they work with, um, the, the values of the company. And also they would rather have flexibility in their career than unlimited vacation days, you know, things like that. So it's, it's figuring out, you're not, it's kind of like when you go to buy a house, unless you have an unlimited budget, AKA you don't have to work, um, you're not going to get everything you want in that house, right? You are going to prioritize, all right, I really want wood floors. I really want, you know, whatever x amount of bathrooms and like that's kind of the same thing when you're searching for a job you're not going to get everything you want um but what are the three most important things for you i love the i love the ideal the the concept of putting down the ideals because then you're focused on something just more like and then just i need a job yeah Oh, totally. It, I find too, the most frustrating part about a job search for people is they don't feel like they have any control over it. Mm. So this does give you control. And when you figure out where you want to work, then you can figure out, oh, I've never worked for that type of tech company before. Fine. Go find ways to fill those skills gaps. You know, when people talk to me about career transitions and I ask them, all right, what have you done to fill the skills gaps? They're like, well, I don't know what the skills gaps are. Who are you talking to at those companies to find out what the skills gaps are? I mean, Every it, careers at the end of the day, sometimes can be as simple as just following the breadcrumbs that you lay down to get to the, the next step or the next goal. And if I was a woman, I'd be looking at the hierarchy of their boardroom, you know, their management, whatever it's called, the, yeah. the thing they usually have on the website. And I'd be like, how many women are here? What sort of opportunity? You know, things are changing and, and getting better with glass, uh, not having glass ceilings, but still, you know, I mean, we're, we're far enough into this where a lot of boardrooms should have women uh, and, and high manager positions. Uh, I know anytime I look at certain, so certain of those trees of hierarchy, I just go, um, that's a lot of white guys. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. doesn't, that needs to change. Uh, what about glassdoor.com? Would you ever check glassdoor to, cause I, I've read there are some companies that are on Glassdoor. They're like fun to read because they're like uh, a just complete car crash of bad managers and bad CEOs. I, I would be checking that just to, you know. Clark. I think wherever you can find information is great. Glassdoor, I always encourage people to remember that, you know, a disgruntled employee writing <laughs> something, you know, so you just have to remember where, like, it's, it's like, is the company always going to say they're so amazing on their careers page? Of course. So use, you know, look through that lens, you know, a little differently, look through the lens of Glassdoor a little differently and also do your own research. Everybody wants to be able to just read about something online because it's fast, but you know, my best advice is go straight to the source of people who do work there right now and talk to them about it. Mm -hmm. What about, uh, I don't know, this is kind of an off topic thing, but not an off topic, but it's kind of from left field because I don't know if it's in your book. But if I was, if I really wanted a job at a place and I'm really good at LinkedIn and I'm really good at like reaching out to finding other people that work there and worming my way around, uh, I would almost kind of like, you know, I would send him a resume to HR or whatever, but I'd almost kind of like 
maybe reach out to some executives that work there and go, Hey, I was thinking about working for your company. Uh, what's it like over there? Maybe, maybe, you know, just see if I can get an edge or an in, I don't know. Does that, yeah, is that no, crazy? definitely. No, it's not crazy at all. And you know, a lot of companies hire based on referrals. They literally reward employees mm. for referrals that get hired. Um, so people, you know, you sometimes have an incentive to take the convert, you know, take oh. the phone call. Um, it's not crazy at all. I always tell people when they're applying for a job, if you just sent it through an online application, that's all you did, then you have not finished applying for the job. Mm. You need to make sure you send your resume to a real person. If you can find, you know, the recruiter's name and email address, you can do it that way. If you can network your way into it, it doesn't even mean that you're going to get the job, but it means that somebody's real eyeballs might look at it. Um, you know, and, and that is incredibly important especially right now when there are fewer jobs and there are people applying for them, it's going to, I don't know that's a hundred percent, but I would say that it's going to be the majority of jobs are found through networking because employers don't have to take a risk at hiring someone that they can't, they don't know anything about too. So, you know, these are people are probably listening and being like, Oh, I hate that. It's not fair. It's you're right. It's not fair or it's not right. But I'm <laughs> just giving, fair. I'm just giving you the insider's point of view of sometimes how, how I've heard of other people getting jobs. And so you should think about that for your own strategy. Careers are not just like a box that you, you know, you follow the rules and everything goes your way. That's why so many people get frustrated with job searches. So you have to be a creative problem solver. And it seems to me like with the tips that you've espoused, um, this kind of focuses you into uh, going with companies that that, that uh, are more along your set of values, more along your set of ideals, and you're not going to be spending so many hours driving all over town, you know, going to all these interviews. Um, you know, we used to interview a lot of people with my company, and there were sometimes you'd just be in the resume, going through a resume with them, and you're like, why are you here? Because I don't even think you understand, number one, the job you're applying for, and number two, you're just not, you're not even a fit. Like, you know, yeah. we were, we were looking for a pipe fitter and you have secretarial skills and there's nothing wrong with either, but, but still you'd, you'd just be like, you're wasting your time and I'm wasting my time, but I feel bad for you because you're looking for a job. Um, and, uh, so you narrow, you get help people get it narrowed down to something that's more fitting for them. And then hopefully when they get that job, it's going to be more fulfilling because you can, <laughs> I've been on the side where you can earn a lot of money. But if your work is miserable and you hate everyone around you, you can, there's just not enough money to deal with that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I feel like one of the things you really want are to create these good habits with your career up front. Or, you know, if you're in the middle of your career and you're listening to this, it, there's never too late to start creating good habits, like advocating for yourself, learning how to uh, have boundaries in place, um, keeping a work journal so that you can track your mm. accomplishments and your patterns. Maybe you start to recognize, oh, this is when I have this interpersonal challenge. And like, being again, proactive, right? You can either be the person who sits in that job for 30 years waiting for it to end and clocking in, clocking out. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, like I said, the power moves are the difference between being successful and fulfilled versus maybe just someone who's successful, which is totally possible to do. Um, but for me, I want to be engaged with some of the work that I'm doing. It's work. That doesn't mean every day is uh, rainbows and butterflies and everything's amazing, you know? But I, I think that you, you have to start to think about how can I make these intentional moves versus, again, just kind of sitting back. And I think that's important too. Uh, you know, uh, the one young lady from Facebook, uh, Cheryl Sandberg, she wrote the book, uh, lean in. Uh, and I've, and I've read, I've read a lot of things over the years that one thing women do is they do a job really well and they expect to get rewarded for that. Like most people should, but then, you know, there's other different things that, that they get passed over or skipped, whether it's, whether it's, you know, from the boys club or, or other issues, but it sounds like what your power moves do is it helps position them to make sure that they're being seen and they're being, they're, you know, seen as a mover and shaker and like, yeah. Hey, this person is a go getter. Uh, they're, they're doing the right thing. Um, you know, it's just one of those things you, you have to, you, you kind of have to be your own, you have to be your own champion. It's like, mm -hmm. if you ever had that roommate or that relationship with a person and they're like, you never do the dishes. And I'm like, cause you never see me do the dishes. And so then you have to start just, you know, 
<laughs> make sure you, <laughs> they see you doing it. And sometimes bosses are that way. You've got to be like, hey, I did this great thing. That journal that you mentioned, that's probably important when you go in for like an annual What's yeah. the things they do or the uh, yeah an annual review a performance yeah. review their work journals are probably the best tip i can give to anybody who whether you're an entrepreneur or you are working inside of an organization tracking your accomplishments hmm. tracking keeping track of the areas that need improvement um challenges you came across lessons you've learned um you know you can't change your patterns if you don't recognize them if you don't kind of keep track of when do i fall into these habits or this thing or, or whatever it is um um, the other thing I like about work journals, whether you uh, track it daily or at the end of each week, is that it's a habit that I found a lot of successful people do is they kind of track that kind of stuff. But also it helps you embrace progress over perfection. Perfectionists, nothing's ever good enough. The, the, the finish line's always being moved on them, right? That's a kind of a miserable way to exist is everything's just never good enough and you're always moving the finish line on yourself embracing uh, progress. And there's actually this book called The Progress Principle where they found that when you start to embrace progress and you um, track it more often, it creates more forward momentum. So you actually end up getting more done than the, mm. you know, so uh, the perfectionist who is over there thinking, I'll make it better, better, better. So that's another really important tip is that are you embracing progress at your job? Are you looking at your careers as this thing that's ever evolving? Or do you look at it like, well, I'm just not happy here, but when I change this job, everything will be different. Well, you take yourself wherever you go, right? <laughs> so like you can change your environment, but if you're not tracking um, those patterns and you're not changing anything, it's probably going to be the same. Ralph Waldo Emerson, wherever you go, there you are. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I remember that. Um, there was something else you mentioned in your thing, and uh, I was so caught up in the information you were giving me. Um, uh, I would think, oh, uh, with your journal, I, th I would think that when you go to the, to the review, that makes it easier for you to advocate for yourself. Oh, 100%. Most people cannot remember what they had for dinner last night. So imagine when you're being asked, okay, over the last year, where did you make an impact? People are like, I've done nothing. <laughs> you know, like they can't think of anything. So the work journal is incredibly important to help you um, walk into those reviews being like, I've done all these things. Here's the impact they've made. Here are the good, com you know, the compliments people have given me. Uh, by the way, I'd like a raise and a promotion. It's a lot double, easier to ask that. <laughs> double my salary, boom. And, you know, people like that because they forget too. I mean, I, I as a boss of uh, pff, thousands of people, uh, I would forget you know, what people do. And they'd be like, yeah, Chris, I did that one, one time. And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, okay, yeah. Um, and so bosses forget too. I think if I were for uh, other people, if I ever did, I like have in my office, like I'd make my own plaques, like <laughs> just clean the copier today. You know, I just have like a whole wall of people being like, wow, you achieve a lot. And I'm like, not really, but there's a lot of plaques. So uh, maybe I'll get more pay. I don't, I don't, is that legal to do in a company? I don't know. Um, you can try it. <laughs> you can try. I mean, they, what are they going to do? Fire me? Yeah. Uh, probably. Um, so uh, fourth step in your book. So the fourth step is money. Uh, obviously, we can't talk about careers. The good part. About, yeah, the good part. And not talk about money. Um, so, you know, money is power. Money gives you options and opportunity. It gives you security. Um, so it's, it is an important part of your career. I do not ever use the words uh, figure out what you're worth. You're a human. You're already invaluable. What mm -hmm. I talk about is figuring out the market value for your skill set. So, you know, that's just like a slight shift in language of how you talk about money is not about what you're worth, but what about your market value for the skills that you bring because you can make more or less based on the market value of those skills. So we talk a lot about in the book how to figure out what that market value is, um, how to negotiate for a raise or how to negotiate that first time salary. One of my favorite tips in the money section of the book is about um, starting a whisper network. So especially for entrepreneurs um, where maybe you're not being paid a salary, but you're getting paid from one-off clients or speaking gigs or something like that, you want to make sure that you're paid fairly. Um, I'm part of a whisper network. There's five of us on a text message chain. Um, we're all fairly similar in what we do and we get asked to speak at a lot of the same stuff. And so when I get asked to speak, I'll text it to the group saying, um, I'm speaking at this thing. Here's how much they're paying me. If somebody mm -hmm. else is also doing that, we'll double check it. We've had it done before on us where, um, 
she was p- being paid uh, a lot less than what I was being paid. And she was able to go back and advocate. And the whole point of the oh, whisper wow. network is that you don't share who's in it. You don't, yeah. you know, let that information out, but those can be really valuable to just kind of have this uh, maybe small group of people who you trust to make sure you're being paid fairly for your work. That's pretty awesome. I, I, that's really smart because a lot of people, um, you know, they, they're always negotiating whenever they call you up to speak or do stuff, uh, you know, and sometimes they want to see how much they can get for free. And, uh, and that way people can stand up for themselves and see more value. I mean, my big thing is I, I always, the worst thing you can ever do in a negotiation is find out later you left money on the table. I hate that. Yeah, it makes everybody feel gross. It makes the person who left it on the table feel like they never want to work with that person again. It's yeah. it's, it's just not good. You feel a little cheated. Um, and and uh, But yeah, I, I love that idea. One of the ideas that I used to espouse back in the days when I uh, my my one partner that I'd had for 13 years left our company and, and I was kind of alone and so I didn't really have a board of directors to to uh, bounce stuff off of or anything else. And so I created what I called the virtual board of directors. And so it was kind of like a whisper thing like you talk about where I'd be able to call five or six other entrepreneurs and bounce ideas off them and they would bounce their ideas off of me. And, uh, you know, that kind of gave me that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Going going back to one element you talked about in the book that I'd, I'd had a question on earlier, you talked about relationships. Um, I, I would imagine that, you know, how healthy your home life is, how, how, uh, making sure there's not a lot of contention there, abuse, uh, there's probably a lot of different things that women have to deal with, you know, in, in being quality relationships. And and then you've got your kids and everything that's going on and making sure there's a good health life balance there or good relationships, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, I think finding a partner who is truly a partner um, for women is incredibly important. Um, I I will say that you can have the right partner, pick the timing of everything perfectly. And for women, it's still going to be like, you know, it's still hard to quote unquote, have it all. Um, But I think having the right partner who your career is just as important as their career, they're an equal partner when it comes to home life and and taking care of the kids, that is invaluable. And it's something that um, I think a lot of women will tell you is, you know, makes a night or day, night and day difference for pursuing their, you know, professional dreams, I should say, versus, feeling like they can't. So I I think, I think that's definitely important. I think it's also really important in relationships that you're, you know, just like anything in life, healthy relationships or healthy balance of all things seems to work best. You know, moderation seems to be the answer for most things. (laughs) Most definitely. Uh, So I love the power moves. I really love that. I think that's really good. It puts women forth. It makes sure that they lean in. It makes sure that they, uh, you know, they, they show they're active because I honestly, as an employer, some of my best employees, uh, especially ones that were, were usually female, actually, um, guys are idiots. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, I know I've got a firsthand knowledge. Um, <laughs> but no, most of my great employees were females and they were usually the quietest workers. Like they would work hard. Um, and, uh, long hours i mean they usually be the last ones to stay and but they wouldn't they wouldn't run around pom-poming going hey i'm working really hard and i'm staying late i remember one time we had a, uh one of my uh a gal who worked for me and then we we took on an insurance policy and they want us to remove her because she had a lot of issues she had shingles and different things and i said i'm not firing her she's one of my greatest employees she's here like two hours past the thing, you know, most, most all my other employees, you know, they're, they're in that uh, sprinter position at the line when, you know, four, four fifty nine comes around, right. To run to the checkout. And so, um, a lot of my best employees have been my most quietest place. They're the heads down, they do the work, they, they usually have the most highest amount of performance, but one of the challenges, they don't have that raw, raw where they go out and they push, you know, meanwhile, I got the other guy who's in, you know, my office every day, hump my leg. You need a coffee, Chris, you need to oh, I'm your greatest employee, you know? And you're like, uh, you find out later, he's the guy stealing from you or something. That's I've seen <laughs> that movie. Usually, usually it's kind of interesting. One thing I found of being a, a boss, the harder someone, uh, just really, spends their time trying to trying to get in with me and you know uh you know make sure that i'm in 
the the less time they're spending at their desk usually working and usually the more they're humping my leg the more i gotta go uh i should really look into what their performance stats are like yeah and i know and i'm a different manager than some people there's there's managers that run things like a high school popularity contest those are the worst um and uh, or some of the worst um and uh so you know it comes down to the management style uh what about looking into the uh uh, looking into the CEO, because the one thing I've always uh, uh, been bound to, especially from all the learning I did, is everything comes down from the, the man or woman on the white horse. And they really set the tone uh, for the company. Um, yeah. uh, any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I definitely think that the more structure you put in place, meaning people know what's expected of them, they have clarity around you know, your values, your mission statement, your why behind, why are you all here? Like the more clarity and structure you can give people, the happier they seem to be with it. So, you know, putting together an employee handbook that states, you know, what people should wear in the office, you know, small stuff like that, all the way to the big stuff of like, here are our values. Here's what we don't stand for. Um, I think that most people do better with that. And a lot of bosses don't do that because it's, I know it's very time consuming too. Um, you know, making sure that people understand when you give bonuses or raises and, and, uh, promotions, understanding, um, how they will be evaluated. You know, there's, there's a lot of, um, I think kind of secrecy in the workplace where people are like, I don't really know where I stand with things. And so I think for a manager and look, being a manager or, or, or the CEO, all the above, it's really hard. And very few people actually get management and leadership um, training. So one of the things I would say to all leaders, uh, managers, leaders uh, of their companies is invest in your own development, whether that's hiring a coach or reading great books, listening, pot, like there's so many ways that you can develop your career, but I think that, and it's true, people don't leave bad uh, jobs. They leave bad job or bad bosses, you know? And so, um, and one of the things that I have found is that a lot of issues at work come down to a couple of key areas. Uh, management's one, communication is one, expectations is one, um, and just overall structure. You know, they don't know what is expected. Um, and, and one of the other things I would say that would be good for all teams to do is to have some upfront kind of conversations around like, how do you prefer to be communicated? When is a good time? Like, how does the communication style work here for every bit on the team? Um, so there's a lot of things that bosses can do to be good bosses and to build environments or build teams that are built on trust and uh, mutual respect and aligned values. And those are the most successful teams. And, they, and it trickles down through the organizations. If I was looking for a job at a place and using the great principles you put forth, one of the things I'd be doing is watching videos, which is really great, you know, that we have all this content these days. I'd watch videos of CEOs and, you know, some of their talks and what they're espousing, what they're broadcasting as their values and stuff, because a lot of them do that in these, in these, uh, in these speeches they do. And, uh, and I'm kind of trying to be, get a sense of their management style, because that's really where it's at when – when, uh, you know, the man or woman, like I call it on the white horse, um, they, they set that tone for the corporation and depend upon that tone, uh, the values of those, that corporation run through. And so if you've got, you know, we can probably, I don't know, reference some politics and go, well, that tone clearly makes some differences down, down the pathway that we go to. Um, you can find bad corporations, I'm sure too. I can't think of any off the top of my head where the CEO just is an awful person. The company is a people and so you don't want to go to work for those places um so this is a great book i love the different techniques that you have in here um one question i have is uh, a power move pushing the ceo and his chair down the fire steps so that you can get his job uh probably not a power move uh right, hang well, on one second. Say, let me write this probably down not a legal power move <laughs> note to self lauren says that's bad don't do <laughs> I'll yeah. let me circle that just to make sure. All right, so good to know. I'm gonna I'm gonna be empowered when I do this. So uh, I really appreciate you being with us here, Lauren. You've got some really great techniques and ideas. I love that you're helping empower women. Uh, I love women. Um, I, 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 I've been uh, over the past couple of years, going back to 2008. I've been wanting more women to be in politics 
to represent themselves in the legislature. And we've been seeing them step up. We're seeing a lot more women entering the job force and everything else. And, and I think it's great. I think it's great. I love, I love everything that looks like America does and everyone should have the same opportunities and freedoms and what they want to do. So um, give us uh, your last parting uh, thing on what uh, we should know further about you and uh, we'll go out. Yeah. So last thing I'll just say is that power moves are available to everybody. Remember, they're not just for some people. Anybody can make a power move today. The book can be uh, found at powermovesbook.com. And I encourage anybody who's thinking about any career stuff to to really give this a shot because uh, a lot of the tools that we talk about are to help you be more fulfilled and successful in your career. So, um, and then my website is careercontessa.com and then at careercontessa on all the social media channels. Awesome sauce. And the book is Power Moves, How Women Can Pivot, Reboot, and build a career of purpose. Uh, this is awesome. Check it out. You can get it on Amazon. I'm sure individual booksellers near you. Uh, thanks, Lauren, for being on the show today and giving us these wonderful tips. Uh, this will be awesome for people that uh, hopefully there won't be as many people looking for jobs, but I'm, I guess there already are, so I can't, <laughs> can't try and uh, spin that. But uh, definitely check out our book, Empower Yourself. I think it's great. Uh, and it sounds like, like I said, some of the reviews I read of people that uh, have been just really appreciative of what you're putting out with the Contessa website, they've been really like, this is awesome. So uh, you're helping empower women and keep them engaged. Yeah. Love, yeah. love my job. I'm so lucky. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. I love it. You just took it right from a thesis. I think, I think uh, the guy, uh, Fred Smith, who created the FedEx, his thing came from a college thesis that I think he oh, got an Oh, well, that's on. good news then. <laughs> yeah. The, the, my understanding of the story is, is that, is that, uh, uh, his professor either failed him or gave him a D minus. He says, this is the dumbest plan for FedEx ever. Like, why would someone want to pay you extra when they can pay the post office? <laughs> oh, we <laughs> so know how that's I, turned out. <laughs> yeah, we know how that turned out. So I love the power of entrepreneurs. Uh, thanks to my honest for tuning in. We certainly appreciate you guys being here. Be sure to give us a like, subscribe to us on YouTube, hit that bell notification button so you can get all the notifications of everything we do. Uh, be sure to check out Lauren's book. There'll be a link on the Chris Voss show. You can take and hit that button or you can hit that on youtube.com forward slash Chris Voss. Uh, be safe, be well, and we'll see you next time.